Well, I want to thank everyone uh, for coming today. I especially want to thank uh, John and Ian and John for uh, inviting me uh, and giving me the opportunity to speak to you. Uh, this talk is going to be based upon uh, my book. Uh, like all books, especially books that are semi-autobiographical in a way, I could digress on any of these subjects for an infinite amount of time. So if there's anything in particular you have a question about, uh, I'd be happy to uh, take it later. I'm going to be moving pretty quickly through about 200 years of uh, American history, transnational history. Uh, so there's some subjects that I'm going to touch on lightly, but others uh, uh, that uh, might be of more interest to this particular crowd I'm going to emphasize. So I was just at a conference a few days ago in the United States, a uh, labor law conference where one of the professors, an expert on Japanese labor law, got up and lamented, as you might uh, know happens often in the US, about how Americans don't care anything about the law of other countries. Right? Uh, and the, sort of the state of American comparative law is pretty sad. Right? There's a variety of indicators you could use to measure this. Right? When it comes to academic training, knowledge of foreign countries uh, for American legal academics is essentially uh, irrelevant. Right? When you look at scholarship, the preponderance of uh, comparative views is rather limited. Uh, and in a basic sense, as people in the UK could appreciate, uh, the US doesn't even really consider itself to be part of the common law world, right? When you learn uh, contracts in the United States, you don't learn contracts in the other common law worlds. If you look at our constitutional law, citing the practice of other common law countries is very uh, unusual. And so the book tries to explain how this particular quality came to the US, what I call universal parochialism, meaning our law can serve as a universal blueprint for every other country. But at the same time, our legal culture is so particular that we can't import or influence or use anyone else's culture, right? legal culture in a sense. So there's no import, there's an only an export orientation. And the story that the book tries to tell then is how there was a shift, a quite radical shift, from an earlier period in American history when comparative law was quite robustly used to stimulate domestic legal reform in the United States to this transition towards influencing foreign legal systems. So some of you may be familiar with the type of scholarship or the ideas around this notion of law and development. Right? Uh, there's a literature in the United States starting around the 1950s or 60s uh, about these efforts to export American law abroad or influence foreign legal development. And one of the curious things that many people who write in this field episodically or consistently is why it continues to be so popular when, in fact, it never works out on its own terms, right? There's this notion that if we can get a particular American legal institution to be transplanted, it will both lead to political and economic liberalization along American lines and foreign contexts, but, as you may know, that never really happens. And once people engage in these projects systematically, there's always some sort of mea culpa or critique afterwards about why it didn't work out. Okay? But this has happened multiple times in multiple geographies uh, over the course of the last century. And this is not just something that lawyers in America believe in right, as a project, uh, or elites even uh, elite lawyers. It's a popularly held concept. The average American thinks that this form of export right, is something that's a sort of humanitarian exercise for the rest of the world. And one of the motivations in also writing the book is that there's a lot of stories to explain other legal cultures that have had these characteristics, right? This type of export orientation is, you know, core to colonialism. And this particular looking at the relationship with China is not only important historically for things that I'll outline, but the relationship between the U.S. and China is hard to capture using frames like empire or exceptionalism or the frame that's most popular in my sort of adjunct discipline, anthropology, legal imperialism. Right? So there's some commonalities in this type of exceptionalism that the US happens, but it's not the same uh, for elsewhere. Um, and the other emphasis is that when people generally criticize this type of project, they talk about it as an imposition on other legal cultures. And in my book, I explore really the cost to American legal culture of this engaging in this project. Right? So it's not just neutral for the US to have this particular attitude towards the rest of the world. Right? So the book actually starts out uh, with things that are very counterintuitive to the sort of contemporary American consciousness, which is during the European Enlightenment, as some of you may know, China was actually held up by many people as an exemplar of the ideal secular rational state. Okay? So people like Leibniz and Voltaire looked at chaotic Europe and saw sort of stable and the long-lasting regime in China and said that this is something worth emulating. Now, I won't go into the, the details of how that reversed uh, in, in Europe, even though quite Australia did, along with uh, imperialism. But the striking thing then is if you look at the American founders, right? You may be familiar Thomas Jefferson, Benjamin Franklin, 
these people actually were deeply interested in Chinese law. Right? Benjamin Franklin pretended to be Confucius and wrote advice letters in the Philadelphia Gazette. Right? Uh, there was a, a desire to use the civil service exam from China as an example of an anti-aristocratic reform in the United States. And there was a broad sort of hunger to look at what could be adopted about Chinese law to help form the sort of basis of American Republic. Now again, knowledge of China was limited at the time, right? Other European influences were much stronger on the actual sort of shape of the American Republic. But on sort of a cognitive level, there's a complete openness, right, to importing and using these other types of ideas uh, and indigenizing them in the American context, okay? Now, there's a very sort of economic component to the story that I'm going to tell that is probably the point, the part that I'm going to cut out the most. But if you also look at the revolutionary era in the U.S., the idea of trading with China, right, and this is key to American understandings of international law, was seen as a symbol of America's ascension both as a post-colonial nation free from Britain, right, but as sort of a high-status player in the international world, right. So the famous Boston Tea Party, right, the tea that was being dumped into the harbor was uh, tea from China, right? There was this fight. Many people, elites in the U.S. especially, were interested um, in directly trading with China as opposed to uh, during the colonial arrangement. Okay? Uh, so the second after the, you know, the, the U.S. Revolution was successful, missions started, trade missions to, to China started up immediately. And it was seen as so important to have good relationships with China that people who had negative views of China and Chinese law actually, like John Quincy Adams, had their writings suppressed, had very had a difficult time getting those things published, right, at the turn of the 19th century. Right? Uh, now, one of the things that makes law central to this particular type of equation is that for American popular culture, law has a particular traction. Now, lots of people explode, there's, uh, there's lots of implicit cultural characteristics to being American, but they don't have the same, we don't, we don't have the same sort of shared cultural history that many nations do, right? There's an ideological quality to the nation of, you know, to the, the idea of having a national revolution predicated on a claim of legal rights. And so uh, one of the interesting things during the 19th century as we move sort of away from the sort of early fascination with Chinese law is that China became the sort of symbol for working out exactly how the U.S. was going to be different from Britain and represent itself in the international context. Right. So before the Opium Wars, right, some of you may know that the, the European you know, powers imposed their military will to be able to, to engage in the opium trade in China, the U.S. actually deeply criticized this, said that this represents British aggression, we are not like this, we are not going to participate in this type of action because we're not a colonial power, right? We're an empire, potentially, but we're either just a commercial empire or we're especially we're an empire of law. Right? Now, that switched after the Opium Wars, right, in part because the U.S. was, again, this weak state who wanted to participate as equals in the international uh, arena, so they still signed extraterritorial treaties with China, but they put in content into the, uh, into the treaties about, right, respecting sovereignty in China, right? They, they even made comments where the, they wanted to have the longest treaty to show and represent how concerned with law they were, right? I mean, really, they had they counted the words in the treaties of other uh, European nations and made sure that their treaty was the longest. Uh, so again, one of the things we could talk more about is through writing the book, I came to realize that uh, these sort of histories of international law that focus on sort of like the civilizing aspect of international law, during this period of time, China that gradually became the sort of intermediate space. Okay? China wasn't a savage society, right? As the European powers you know, continue to impinge on uh, on China, uh, it was no longer sort of the exemplar of a stable and lasting empire that it had been in earlier eras, but it was a potential place to be regenerated. It was sort of like a fallen empire. And in the United States, this particular idea, right, that law could be used to regenerate another country outside of colonialism was particularly attractive. The other thing that you start to realize during the 19th century is when you look and see, like, how did people even have an idea of what Chinese law was in the United States? It was almost exclusively controlled by missionaries, specifically religious missionaries. So all, if, even if you go into, like, the early 20th century, most people who are writing about Chinese law anywhere in the world are using representations that missionaries uh, produced. And one of the things then that came to tell a very particular American story in contrast to the European story about the relationship of law to this sort of civilizing mission um, was that in, after the Civil War in the US, the religious missionary movement uh, took over the entire world, 
essentially. Right? The amount of money, the amount of individuals engaged in missionary work, the U.S. had been quite a small participant, but quickly overtook the combined activities of the entire rest of the Western world. Right? So in the book, I sort of go into how this, in some ways for the U.S., was the first sort of transnational civil society movement. And one of the things that distinguished uh, American missionaries in their writings about Chinese law, in contrast to their European compatriots, uh, was that they didn't see Chinese society and law as something that was just corrupt and needed to be replaced, a la colonialism. They saw that Chinese culture was actually compatible with American values and their view, right? They just needed to have the right institutions, right? The people, in, in essence, were good, and they just needed to be gifted with these particular institutions, right? And so this is an important non-colonial move, right? This sort of shifting the idea that the culture doesn't need to be replaced, it's in essence compatible, right? So in the book, I detail actually transitions in specific missionary writings about this idea of compatibility. Certain types of ideas that might seem strange now started to become popular, like the idea that, that Mandarin was the original pre-Babylonic language, right? That everyone in the world spoke, right? And laid the basis for the sort of like general cultural compatibility in the world, right? So it was a really interesting time when people were thinking through these syncretic ideas. The other thing that goes back to the particular American idea of the relationship of law or legalism to uh, American culture is that at the time, there were really sort of strong feelings about the mutuality, the specific mutuality of American Christianity and American common law, right? So it's an idea that this is, starts to be the idea that we're not part of the regular common law world, right? There's something specific about the American common law and that it has a specific relationship to these religious ideas. And there are actually specific Supreme Court uh, decisions that fight out, right, in dicta often, whether or not, right, there is this mutuality and what the consequences of it are. What this allows, right, in a sense, this mutuality between religion and law, is what I argue in the book is actually that missionaries are sort of the forerunners of modernization theory, right? The idea, again, that you could transplant a specific institution into a foreign culture and that it would have this catalytic transformative effect on the rest of society, right? I mean, that's like the key to modernization and development theory, was really something that they pioneered. Now, this was common to religious missionary thought, right? The idea that if you converted religiously, there was an individual transformation that then became a social transformation, right? But the idea that this was also related to law allowed many of the missionaries to make both political and religious arguments simultaneously. One of the really interesting things is that many of the missionaries were actual literal lawyers and missionaries, had undergraduate degrees in law or some legal training and religious education at the same time. Or they were just lawyers who acted out uh, this uh, missionary activity as part of their own humanitarian work. And one of the fascinating things that we look at the discourse that they developed at this period of time is they had very technical debates about how to export this particular package of American Christianity and law to other places. And there's actually, as an anecdote, I discovered this once when I was in a uh, sort of theological school's library at Berkeley, and I had just read a USAID uh, report about the 1990s efforts of the US government to spread the rule of law to various countries. And later that day, I read these missionary journals from the late 19th century about technical debates about how do we de-Americanize Christianity? Right? How do we allow people to have local control over their projects? Right? the technical structure of the debates were actually incredibly similar. Okay? And this sort of led me to this uh, path of discovering how much influence missionaries had on shaping the basic structure of American internationalism. Okay? Remember, at this time, very few American <coughs> traders were in China. Uh, the number of people who were not missionaries, who could speak Chinese right, and relate ideas about China were very small. And if you look systematically, right, we don't even have a formal diplomatic corps at this particular time, right? Missionaries serve in all of these functions, right? They're the intermediaries when treaties are written. Sometimes they're the actual negotiators, right? And one of the things about the missionary movement in the U.S. is to fuel this big effort, they created what many people consider to be the, the, uh, the first modern public relations infrastructure. When a missionary came back from China to the United States, they would go on a circuit and give presentations about the American mission in China, representing ideas of the American uh, potential to transform China, right? And this was in a very disciplined way, right? They, the, the representations that they were able to give, right, were controlled and edited, right, by the larger missionary bodies. So this is why even in rural, you know, the U.S. and Idaho, in the 1910s, when they're negotiating like the, the nature of, uh, of loans 
uh, between the U.S. government and its role in this in consortium with the Chinese government at the time, there's protests in rural America over the terms of our loans to like build railroads in China. There's no reason on a geopolitical right, or economic basis for people to be that concerned, but the missionaries penetrated that deeply into society. Right? And on a more elite level, every first professor of Chinese studies in the US was a former missionary, like almost uniformly. All the foundations, Rockefeller, Ford, that would develop used missionaries and relied on them almost exclusively for their interactions with China. Uh, and so the book goes and looks at some of how this informs these different uh, efforts, legal reform efforts, like to translate international law, right, in China, W.A.P. Martin, again, a lawyer, missionary, the extraterritorial court that was created by the U.S. and China had judges who very clearly said we're here to both Christianize and legalize China. So Chow or Dong Wu Law School was a missionary law school founded um, in China to use American legal education to you know, theoretically train a new generation of Chinese lawyers. And one of the interesting things is as this is going on, right, the thing that's more familiar to writers on international law in the U.S. is the Spanish-American War. Right? At this time, in 1895, the U.S. has this victory. It acquires about the Philippines, Puerto Rico, a bunch of other territories. And this is often used to sort of signal the beginning of a particular idea of American international law through its relationship with these territories. So one of the things I really push back on in the book is to say the truth is the reason why imperialists lost politically in the U.S., right, there was a very specific imperialist and anti-imperialist move, is because the missionaries had already shaped public opinion about the way in which we could engage with the rest of the world, right? So like during the Boxer Rebellion, yes, the U.S. did participate, right, in the sort of the suppression of um, the Boxer uprising, but the discourse, right, the political costs, all of these things in the U.S. were different than they were um, in Europe. So popular history, right, is really important to understanding how these things get shaped and reformed, and you can't understand that popular history, right, without understanding the U.S.-China relationship. And there's sort of a large tendency, because there were these specific Supreme Court cases in the U.S., the insular cases, where we were working out what were the actual constitutional rights of citizens in these territories that we acquired, right? But in truth, this sort of legal discourse was not the discourse that gave rise to the sort of general understanding, popular understanding of America's relationship to the rest of the world. Uh, so one of the other really interesting things about this could have just been, right, the action of missionaries, it could have just been a popular sentiment, but at the turn of the 20th century, just as America is becoming an international power, also there's major transformations in the American legal profession. We shift from a, an apprenticeship-based system right, to a university-based system of legal education. We develop national and regional bar associations. The federal judiciary, after the American War, right, starts to center a part of the centralization of power that had been quite controversial in earlier times of American history. So there's this idea of legal science, right, that becomes central to the professionalization of lawyers, right, and creates this sort of idea that there is a specific package of American institutions that can be transplanted abroad. Okay? Prior to this period of time, you know, American legal history is incredibly diverse. Right? The idea that anyone could sort of point to specific institutions and say this is what sort of makes an American lawyer, this is what constitutes the basis of the profession wasn't there. Um, and so I find in 1905, this is the earliest example, Warren Seavey, who ended up becoming a very famous torts professor in the U.S., uh, was involved in some of the early human rights discourse as well, went to Tianjin to teach at a missionary school with his Langdellian case books, right? This is American contract law, and I am going to go and take it to Tianjin and teach Chinese students this modern law, right, as part of this new process. And because lawyers at that time were competing to elevate their status in American society, right? You may be aware American lawyers dominate our legislatures now. There are higher levels of CEOs than in other countries. There was a process by which they were developing social capital, right? Vis-a-vis -vis other professions and engaging in this type of international work as sort of vanguards of this new American internationalism was incredibly important for those battles, okay? So then if you start looking at the 20th century, right? This becomes more and more entrenched. Uh, you can imagine with the story that missionaries have been telling, in 1911, when the Republican Revolution happens in China, instantly the missionaries can say, this is the consequence, right, of all of these actions that we've been undertaking. Now China really wants to, you know, adopt American institutions. They're going to become a republic. And we're going to show this method of non-colonial influence, okay? Uh, it's not totally coincidental that Sun Yat-sen was attributed with uh, leadership in the revolution, 
is not exactly true, but nonetheless was an inspiration for many people, was a convert to Christianity. Um, and this process, like for many people, solved this tension about what is the nature of American empire, right? We can be a global power and we can be anti-colonial at the same time. And here's this nation, incredibly like former empire, that we're going to help rebuilding. So all of these projects start happening in China, not just in law, right, fusing different aspects of American society, right, and American science into these projects to influence us. This is also then the first instance in the US of this idea that constitution writing itself can be a science, right? This is part of the change in like, the discourse in the US, can be an applied science. So after 1911, a group of both public and private agencies and, and individuals came together to sponsor a project to send a famous comparativist, Frank Goodnow, to China to work under the regime of Yuan Shikai and help write the new Republican infrastructure for China. Now, uh, a lot of this has very important characteristics for how America engages in these projects. It's never very rarely a, a formal public governmental sponsored program, but it's this mesh of private and public interest. The Carnegie Endowment for International Peace is an example of this, as one of the, as the people who sponsor uh, good now form, uh, formally, also again, still relying upon missionaries uh, as, as intermediaries. And I use Goodnow's time uh, as a, an example because he becomes infamous, right? He's actually today, he's still infamous in China and the US and other places. Actually more in the US, he's just sort of like ignored. Because what happened is he did believe in this legal science, but he had not merged that with sort of the evangelical missionary spirit at the time. So he went to China, he did his legal analysis, and he said, China should become a constitutional monarchy. Now, regardless of how you feel about that, and people have lots of feelings in China and the US about it, it didn't validate this idea that what the American interaction was to do was lead to Americanization. So he was essentially blackballed from American uh, internationalism for the rest of his life. Okay? And prior to this, he had been the most famous, right, in some ways, young comparativist and one of the most famous professors in the country. Okay? And he's completely disappeared because of this. Right? So he's this sort of transitional figure in a way where you start to see that there's an orthodoxy that's developing about this particular interaction. Now, even though today the missionary movement on the religious side is still very active all over the world, including in China, you know, most rule of law projects today don't claim a particular religious character. Right? So what the book traces, right, starting uh, in the early 20th century, is then the secularization process. How does this religious like, motivation Right? get removed while maintaining the same, what I would call, conceptual architecture. Now remember, the missionaries had sort of penetrated all of these internationalist institutions at the time. Right? So they had already embedded in these organizations this particular spirit, and you can see the different transitions then that happen. Right? The extraterritorial court, the judges no longer say that they're Christianizing China, right? but there's huge like, uh, debates, and people are actually pulled off of the court for not properly representing American values to the Chinese. Right? So Chow, the, the law school that I mentioned, starts to secularize its curriculum. Right? It focuses on legal science. It weeds out the explicit religious content, but maintaining the same sense of mission right, about what it was achieving in China. Um, I also look at the uh, Far East Asso American Bar Association, which was an example of an attempt to sort of recreate this institution, this National Bar Association in China, to sort of have this effect of coordinating this new type of lawyer who is, again, going to impact this uh, particular uh, interaction. So what you get is a technical discourse, right? Um, but a technical discourse with evangelical uh, assumptions. Okay. So, well, well, I won't get into it now, but we can discuss like the whole discourse about extraterritorial jurisdiction in China, right, is driven by a similar sort of thing. Lots of conferences about judging in China, right, but with this sort of never-ending mentor relationship uh, posited by the U.S., right. I, am, I analyze how this, again, this isn't just an imposition, because one of the things throughout all this is the U.S. is a minor player in China. If you actually look at the governments who had influence, like in the 1920s, Germany had a far more influence than the US, right? This is most idealized or represented by the fact that the common law, the American common law, had virtually no impact, right, on Chinese law prior to 1949, even with this discourse that's going on. Very clearly, right, civil law countries, as interpreted through Japan, were much more influential. Right? But because the US was such a minor player, very little of that feedback got, right, could disrupt this discourse. There was a lack of material content to it that allowed it to be this very durable symbol. And the consequences, you know, it doesn't really matter so much for the U.S. at this time, but I detail like the relationship with Chiang Kai-shek, 
right? Who I call sort of like is the prototypical modernizing dictator, right? There's this whole discourse in the U.S. that here's a, someone who converted to Christianity. Uh, maybe he's an authoritarian, but he really likes property rights. Uh, and he's going to restructure the economy uh, to lay the foundations for a later democratic uh, revolution, right? And I get a little bit into, even though, right, this becomes much more secularized among lawyers, in American popular discourse, it's still very open, right, that this relationship between Christianity and law is what's motivating these relationships, okay? So the book sort of, in, in many ways, provides a legal aspect to what uh, American uh, international historian William Appleman Williams called, like, the tragedy of American uh, internationalism, right? So I call it the tragedy of American legal interaction. Uh, so things like the projects to reconstruct uh, the Japanese and German legal systems after World War II, which are often cited as these sort of exemplars of American exceptionalism, had this an institutional and ideological history that far predated it, right? It just amplified those ideas. And again, if you actually look at the content, right, the fact that we like Americanized the German legal system, People don't even try to make that claim anymore. But when we were invading Iraq and other places, we looked at Japan, look, we gave Japan modern law. Right? And if you know anything about the particular history, you know not only is that inaccurate, but by the 1980s, Japanese law is being held to be the antithesis of American law. Right? So there's some irony to that. But what happens after 1949 when the communists take over China right, is that somehow this has to be explained. Right? We have this particular relationship to China all of a sudden Right? Out of nowhere, the communists take over, and there's a discourse on what's called the loss of China. It's really like a thing that's debated very deeply. It influences our interventions in Vietnam and other places, um, where we could sort of have put down this particular type of cultural mythology, but what happens is it just gets generalized to the rest of the world. Right? So law development, as it's generally discussed starting in the 50s and 60s, was just a generalization of this particular way of relating to the rest of the world. And I use the example of Roscoe Pound, some of you may know Roscoe Pound, um, as also as a case study to show how this transition happened. Pound was a famous comparativist early in his career, said the US should emulate German law, there are all these things wrong with American common law. And in the late 1940s, he goes as an advisor to the Guomindang regime with great fanfare that again, he's gonna rewrite the Chinese legal system. Now, that doesn't happen at all. Uh, he's actually pretty much ignored when he's in China, uh, besides a few sort of intellectual converts. And one of the interesting things is he actually comes to China through the missionary movement, right? He has all these biographies that have written about him, and they generally give like two sentences to And then he retired from Harvard and went to China for two years and then came back. But the truth is this was a major transformative event in his life. He became a rabid anti-communist. He didn't, he would actually write things to the US being like, the communists aren't really powerful. There's no way that they're gonna have any influence in China. You know, we just need to support the Guomindang, don't forget about it. And I actually found personal letters where he would write to Alfred Kohlberg, who was one of these people who supported sort of the McCarthyite movement, saying like, I'll say whatever you want about the State Department in China, right? Because it's important that we support this regime, right? So even though he failed, right, in his own personal terms, he didn't like, go into some sort of personal reevaluation. He reintensified this effort. And Pound was critical of his time to this discourse where then exporting American law is sort of an act of legal nationalism. And to question it, right, is to question your loyalty to the general American project. Okay? And again, even though it's not explicit, behind the lines of this, even for someone who sort of was a validly secular like Pound, was this particular religious segment. I found in his unpublished writings whole texts on the relationship of law and religion that weren't present earlier in his career, right? but he started to work on prior to and during his time in China. Uh, so, you know, uh, the sort of end of the story is what you may be familiar with is now the sort of export orientation uh, become solidified for the rest of the world. Chinese law becomes communist law, not able to be converted, represent a completely shift in the discourse after this particular time. Um, but for the ABA and the AALS and all these institutions of like American uh, legal professionalism, religious discourse continues to be con can even amplified during the Cold War. The idea that American lawyers are part of our fight against the godless communists, right, becomes central again to the identity of American lawyers in a particularly powerful way. The sort of side story of this is people like Pound and Goodnow, who early in their careers only used comparative law to critique American law, right? To think about new ideas for it, okay? That tradition is completely erased. And what actually today people think about comparative law is filled by uh, primarily emigrants from Europe, fleeing war and conflict and persecution, who had to sort of use their civil law backgrounds to make arguments and make themselves relevant to the American legal profession. This was not easy, 
Someone as famous as Hans Kelsen, right, couldn't get a job in the US at a law school. No law school would give Hans Kelsen a job. He had to go to a political science department, right? Um, there's a variety of sort of stories about this. But the type of comparative law that they developed, which was very schematic, taxonomical, right, and not aimed at critiquing American law at all because these people were trying to show that they were part of the American conversation, really became deeply embedded in the professionalization of American law schools that was sort of like uh, entrenched in the 1950s, right, and transformed and erased this previous his uh, history. So then the book goes into a little bit, right, sort of stops in 1949 uh, in the U.S.-China context, discusses how this gets globalized, and now how like, this idea roams to different parts of the world, it's either India, it doesn't work out. So we'll go to Africa, 80s, it doesn't work out. We'll go to the post-Soviet world, it doesn't work out the way we think. And after 1978, this returns to China, but because of this forgetting after 1949, almost all the people who engage in this work have a very limited understanding that this history existed, right? I have an undergraduate degree in Asian and legal studies. I, looked at these, I had no idea that America had any particularly legal relationship right, to China prior to 1949. But by the time this has happened, it's become, you don't have to be good now or pound to go to China. It becomes so normalized, right, that second year law students can be part of projects to write constitutional amendments for foreign countries, right? This idea, it's, it becomes so deeply entrenched in the ideology, right, that this is a humanitarian exercise that no matter how it works out in practice, right, it either doesn't work out because of something that's wrong with the country that's being exported to, or, right, a lack of belief in the project itself. So the consequences for the U.S. Right, of engaging in this essentially futile activity from the title of the book, The Futility of Law and Development, is actually in the end just a negative for the U.S. legal culture. Okay? It makes it very difficult to understand legal developments in the rest of the world when you have this sort of very evolutionary, and there's an evolutionary science story here that I omitted, view of America's relationship to the rest of the world. Right? People write articles about China in the 2000s where you know, a judge cites the constitutional provision in like an education case, and all of a sudden, judicial review is coming to China. Right? If you even have a basic understanding of the structure of the Chinese judiciary, this is ridiculous. Right? Um, but these ideas are, people are always looking for this to happen. That's what happened with, uh, as I claim, with Chiang Kai-shek. Right? Really couldn't understand what was happening in China because the missionary view had to be validated. Right? The other thing is we don't use comparative law for legal stimulus at all, even though in the early 20th century, many of the foundational successes of American <clears throat> law were inspired by other uh, by examples in other countries. Uh, and so it has this stultifying effect here. And then when other people try to understand American law, actually in their own analysis, right, and I talk about China in, in the context here, it warps it, right? If you go to a conference where someone's supposed to present on American administrative law, they'll completely forget about their own very trenchant critique of the operation of American administrative law, and they'll give this like wonderfully idealistic view for the rest of the world, right? American LLM and GSD programs, that you may be aware of graduate degrees, are almost exclusively staffed by foreign students with the idea originally, when this transition happened, that this was part of the process, right, of bringing American law to the rest of the world. And in all these micro you know, interactions and on a macro scale, it just warps, right, our ability to understand others, right, through law and other people's ability to understand uh, us through law. So that's why, in the end, this is sort of a tragic story, right, about a loss of the sort of original cosmopolitanism that was so central um, to this very irascible, deeply embedded uh, sense that this type of work is a humanitarian exercise, which is why, even though there are critiques, and why, even though there's my book, right, this type of work is going to sort of uh, continue uh, until a more major event, right, disrupts, uh, disrupts the sort of long-standing patterns, right, that make these types of assumptions seem to be quintessentially American. That's it. Would we like to do maybe like 20, 30 minutes tops of Q&A, something like that, and then we'll move to reception, maybe shorter? I have a quick, just right off the bat, is just it, the the juxtaposition between legal cosmopolitanism, legal pluralism, early America, and then later legal imperialism, coercive foreign intervention, later America. Uh, if we were abstracting that out, are we just saying that as a country becomes more powerful, it stops being as open 
or receptive to alternative you know, systems? Or was there something particular about the missionaries? You know, how, does, how does that tension play out? So I mean, this is one of the things where, you know, when I presented early ideas about this in graduate school, people were like, ah, oh, this is just colonialism, right? And I really intentionally don't use the legal imperialist phrase when talking about this. Because what, we didn't exert any coercive action on China during this whole period of time. I mean, that's the deep irony. Other countries, through direct or through intellectual influence, had a much greater impact on Chinese law than the United States, right? So it's not an imperialist project in that sense. Right? And it is true, like lots of people, if you read like, go back to like Toynbee and Spengler, all these people who do like meta histories of civilization, it's like an old story, right? As a country becomes, or an empire becomes more successful, it becomes more xenophobic, or it becomes more rigid, and then it collapses, right? So there is a dynamic to that. The part that in the book, um, you know, that I focus on is seeing how this gets permeated through popular and elite culture, right? But as a humanitarian act in this particular non-colonial way. Right? Because descriptively, right, you have to show why is this particular type of American effort different? Why does the average American have any particular cultural affiliation with this type of project? So by contrast, William Kirby, who's a Chinese uh, historian, uh, has a book about Germany, as I mentioned before, in China in the 1920s, during the, uh, in the influence of sort of fascist thought on the woman dominant Chiang Kai-shek. Well, you know, after a while they realized that, uh, well, Chiang Kai-shek sort of just wants to do his own thing. He's not really just going to copy everything we tell him, even though, again, much more influential than the U.S. But no one in Germany is, like, doing rural protests over, you know, backing out of this particular project. Other countries sent people to China to influence them. Japan had a long-standing relationship. Actually, during the time that Goodenow was engaging in his project, he had another constitutional advisor from Japan. But after the whole sort of debacle about constitutional monarchy, that guy wasn't banned from Japanese internationalism, right? It was just part of like normal geopolitics. So this is something that gets to uh, not only like why you, know, you can neglect comparative law when you're powerful, right? But that this has this debilitating effect in the long term, especially today, right? The world, American power is on decline. We're dead, but we still have these same types of attitudes that affect our ability to sort of adapt legally, right? in a sense that most colonial powers are still have the sort of residual, right? Comparative law is not super strong in the UK, right? Plenty of people have talked about that in, in, in the past. But it doesn't have the same type of durability that it does. And it doesn't have the same centrality of popular culture. So it makes changing that very different. So if someone has like a, we have major legislative overhauls, like the healthcare you know, reform that we have, where even mentioning something that goes on in another country is just that that's disloyal, right? You want to kill an idea, just say that the French did it, right? This is an exaggeration, but to say that the Chinese did it, right? Or in my own work, to study like Chinese labor law and then say, oh, this might have something to do with what we're talking about in America, is seen as a complete, not only non-starter, right, but culturally disloyal. So it's a, it's not an issue of complete separation from, from prior examples, right? I mean, the whole discourse on international law, again, as this civilizing agent, right, is parallel to this, but it's how extensive it is uh, and the effects that it has uh, sort of on our own legal culture, I think, are, are much more damaging and extensive than it is in the rest of the world at a particular moment. <clears throat> so just following up on that, is, is there seems to be a just, you, you sort of separate between intellectual history and popular history, or intellectual culture and popular culture uh, in the argument you're making, right? Is that right? Mm -hmm. so, uh, can you explain? Unpack that just a little bit. Well, I mean, in part, I, in part, I emphasize the distinction because in histories of American law, right, just like diplomatic history, elitism is a serious problem, right? You read the writings of various like legal, international like thinkers, and then you get an idea that that's somehow what's going on in American law, right? And it completely neglects this popular. This is partly why we have this idea that like that Spanish American War and the insular cases are like the prototype of American internationalism and law. Right? Because that was what Supreme that's what got to the Supreme Court, and that's what was written about in the Harvard Law Review. Right? But what it doesn't capture at all, right, is the, and this is why the missionary relationship is completely aligned. And people use missionaries as like an analogy often, oh he's a legal missionary. But the fact that they actually structured right, and informed this process is completely omitted because people aren't looking at popular culture. So, of course, there's always an interrelationship between intellectual and legal culture, but it's a really pushback against the elitism uh, that sort of misses a lot of these important historical characteristics in uh, understanding how this process develops and why it's so durable. Yeah. 
That was fantastic. Thank you, sir. So I think mine's a follow-up from John. So to what, how does race and domestic conversation about race in America play into this, right? So alongside this, this foreign relation is the particular domestic um, configuration of race, and particularly the time period seems to overlap with Jim Crow and what the boys called the magical religion of whiteness that's sweeping our shores. And that has a global dimension as well. So Lake and Raymond's at have spoken about the global dimension of the color line house. The creation of white men's countries is happening in Australia, in South Africa, in America as well, all around the same time. And to what, to what extent could the, could the explanation of how China goes from being a civilized society we can borrow from to being a society that we need to impose ideas on, but how does that map onto global conversations about race and the racing of China, so the production of a global white world and the placing of China outside of that? So, not, there's a part of one of my chapters, right, a coda, essentially where I discuss specifically the Chinese Exclusion Acts, right? So, actually, the interesting way in which race uh, plays a role in the U.S.-China context is that this representation of what American law is, when Liang Qichao and other Chinese intellectuals come to the U.S., they see lynchings, and they're like, what? This is not the legal system that's been described to us for 100 years. I open the, the, the book with a poem by a Chinese intellectual who's witnessed an election in the U.S. in the early 20th century, and he's like, he's read George Washington's writing as an inspiration, and he's like, and this is what this has become, right? So the hypocrisy, right, this, it's, it plays a role all the way. When the communists are fighting against the Guomindang and talking about the Guomindang's relationship to uh, the U.S., they cite, right, this racialized injustice that's going on. Now, the Chinese Exclusion Act, right, is the most open version of this. There's a virulently racist domestic discourse against Chinese, and the missionaries, some of them pushed back against this, but some of them sort of used this in a way, right? This is, this is the interesting things about how any discursive formation like maintains itself. They're like, people would make arguments like, well, if you don't want Chinese laborers to come here and ruin our economy, we need to go Christianize and civilize their country, and then they won't. I mean, this is literally what people would say, right? But this is sort of the slippery sort of transition and the racism of the missionaries. It's not that we need to erase their culture. We can modify it. Right? And there's also parallels to like how we treated the Native Americans and the civilizing process there. Right? But it's a type of racism that posits a transformation in a particular type of way that's amenable to this type of process. So yeah, I mean, it's, in some ways it's crazy where people, uh, you know, Sun Yat-sen can cite Henry George, a political economist at the time, right, as a seminal influence. And then there's people in the U.S. citing Henry George, right, to example why Chinese people shouldn't own land in the U.S., right? So it's a tricky thing, but this is part of it. We didn't have a strong material relationship. So this sort of symbolic slipperiness let these things perpetuate themselves. So you can say, yes, you know, Chinese people, you know, shouldn't have this role domestically. But in some ways, it only amplifies this type of international effort. And it leads to, you know, it's like in the dis sort of racist discourse in the US, there's always been a long standing things about how China and other Asians are represented, right? Feminization, all the Timu Ruskola has like written about this. Um, and so it's, you know, all these things are slightly different, right, than just than other formulations, but they're always modified in a way to enable this sort of civilizing project in a non colonial fashion. Right? That's, a, that's always the important thing. It's not like, oh, we should then just go take over China, right? But it's like we need to reinforce this type of project, right, in order to solve this particular domestic problem. And, you know, to their credit, some missionaries resisted this, but some missionaries sold opium, right? So, you know, there is this constant sort of dualism and in, 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 in engaging with this, these types of uh, less normatively desirable frameworks. My turn. Good. All right. Do you think there's a silver lining to any of this? Because I was thinking that this idea of transplanting rules and institutions has been going on for honestly way too long. Like Alexander the Great was the first conqueror that also had a civilizing mission, la la la, so schools and so on and so forth. The other, any other in any sort of conquest is barbaric or more barbaric than the person actually conquering. And this sort of, this idea of Fixing legal systems has been very much streamlined through the UN as well, so it's not going away anytime soon. So why studying this particular sort of transplanting and doing comparative law? Do you think there's any sort of silver lining to it? Well, I mean, uh, there, there's a silver lining in the sense that there's a lot of comparative law analysis to do, right, and, and, and showing how these transplantation efforts work out or don't work out in the end, right? My critique is essentially a normative critique in the sense that they, the effect that they have on the U.S., right, and the fact that they don't realize this particular ambition, 
Now, Alan Watson, right, is a classic legal historian talking about transplants that has been going on for a, a wide period of time. And but the thing that I sort of end the book with is this isn't just sort of like a call for like legal isolationism, right? We shouldn't do this type of thing. And often this is the pushback I get back in the U.S. They're like, well, you're saying we should do nothing. There's bad things in the world, and you're saying that we should do nothing. It's ethically impossible to do this. What I'm really talking about is the type of engagement that you're talking about, on some level, is unavoidable, right? But it's the terms of that engagement. So why I use the word legal cosmopolitanism, right? And why I focus on how this warps understandings of American law abroad and our understanding of other places is because I say that comparative law, especially in the modern era, is not only like easier but unavoidable, and how we do it is really important from just a purely self-interested national point of view, right? How we engage in this type of process is critical, and our inability to do it, right, is a big downside for the U.S. Now, you know, what are the pluses? The U.S. spends billions of dollars on these projects, and you can get a grant as a law professor someplace else in the world that's 10 times your salary, which in part explains why, you know, people who engage in this work often don't get honest feedback from their uh, cross-cultural interlocutors, right? But, you know, uh, it's, it's a sort of this perversion in this context really doesn't lead. So if you talk about like the post-Soviet world and just transplanting various corporate and securities codes from the U.S., right? I mean, in the end, that was part of a conversation about reconstituting those legal systems. But if they had a more honest uh, understanding of how those things actually worked in the U.S., the fact that copying and transplantation had this history uh, that wasn't uh, quite as uh, idealistic as <coughs> Uh, I think it's, it's, it's still important to, to, to point those things out. So uh, is there like a silver line? I mean, you can always find something, right? But I don't, I, I, I appreciate it as a systematic problem. What would be considered a successful example of transplanting lawyers? So for example, like I'll give a Brazilian example. Uh, the reform of the Brazilian stock market. Okay? Uh, even there was a, a feeling that the Brazilian stock regulations, right, securities regulations, only favored a certain type of stock holding, concentrated, primarily familiar stock holding, right? So they created a split system, right, where you could list companies using corporation, corporate law, securities law from the U.S. and other places, and there was a specific project, right, to go out and interrogate those traditions and indigenize them. The Japanese through both the Meiji and the post-World War II effort, engaged in massive systemic comparative law exercises, right? Where they were able to adapt new systems into their particular conditions. Now, is there a successful example of going places and trying to influence externally? Uh, I'd say, if there are, right, they're, you know, they're the exceptions that, that prove the rule, in a sense, right? And so really, on the whole, domestically oriented comparative law trying to bring in, right, this is part of what I'm arguing about, but this push effort, the whole history of rule of law projects, like every 10 years, someone writes, over the last 10 years, we've done all these things, it hasn't worked out, and here's why. And then 10 years, it happens. Or someone goes to, you know, somewhere in Central Asia and tries to reform their domestic, you know, violence levels by changing their, you know, sexual assault laws and various other things. And it doesn't work out and they write an article and they say why and then they come back, right? But because it's so bad, it keeps happening. So the, you know, the weight of the successes, uh, whatever they may be, is, is, is pretty disproportionate when it comes to this externally oriented push. At least that's my, that's my claim. Thanks again, Jed, for visiting us. We're very, very pleased to, to have you here. And of course, your talk was, was fascinating. I'm part of, particularly interested in this claim, one of the many claims you've made, but this, this one, the following in particular, which is that actually the, when you export legal culture, or I would say when you export patterns of legal argumentation, this may backfire. Actually, this may detrimental to your influence um, and your, your reputation. And, and I, th I do think that this is something uh, to which international lawyers, and there are many international lawyers in the room, who, there's something they can relate to. Actually, in international law, you could find many examples of, of such a claim of, you know, export backfires. And I mean, there are two examples I can think of now, which is the first one is the example of, 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 of modes of legal reasoning which have been exported and, have, and which have been proved detrimental to the exporter. One is the idea of system and systematic think, systemic thinking about international law. So with all the emigrants, Kelsen, Oppenheims, and others, systemic thinking uh, came into uh, Anglo-Saxon thinking about international law and proved quite influential at the beginning. But eventually, 50 years later, 
Now systemic thinking is looked at with suspicion. It's looked at something European, formalistic. So nowadays, European legal thought is actually looked on at because it's, 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 it's too systemic. So it's, it's, I think it, it goes along the same line as, as, as those examples you've, you've, you've provided. You have influence and then it backfires. The second one is actually lack of, inf lack of export or failed export, which eventually turned rather favorable. And that's state responsibility. The Americans won when, I mean, when they created international courts. International courts were primarily an American project. It sounds a bit odd, a century later. And, but they tried to give to these courts the language of arbitration and all the arbitration experiences in, 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 on the American continent. And they failed. It's the Europeans who managed to get a monopoly on the design of responsibility and language of these new courts. But today, so Americans failed to export their patterns of legal argumentation in terms of responsibility. But what you've seen today, about 100 years later, is that the market of international arbitration is dominated by US law firms. So it means that they failed to export. But eventually, today, it, the situation is very favorable to them. So, so just, it's just a comment. I'm just extrapolating from the perspective of, of international law. It's, it's, it's a very, it's a wonderful claim, and, and I think international law is a lot much to say about it. So it's like, yeah, I mean, a lot of this is because this is a, a history, right? And un, I, a lot of the book is just getting at the descriptive history of how this happened and why. But the, it's a general principle, right? I mean, really, I'm talking about an imagination of how comparative <coughs> law should be practiced that's generalizable to any context. And in, in the conclusion, right, I, I talk a little bit more about this in like a concrete sense, right? But in any case, if you overpromise things, right, and it doesn't work out, this is what people write about this in the rule of law. Like, we spend all this money, we, and after a while, you know, donor, like our receptor countries, all of a sudden, you know, law is seen as not a good thing because, oh, they kept trying to bring this law, it didn't really work out. And the best example, this is like authoritarianism, right? The adaptation of like rule of law discourse, uh, you know, uh, regimes adopting aspects, managerial aspects of legal technology from other countries for completely different reasons is in part enabled both by like the ennui of this constant failure of export, right? But the idea that we can have this transformative effect later, right? So we can explain away failure, right, in these particular moments, right? But it doesn't come back to actually change how we do things because of that particular structure. So, I mean, when you say this thing about, about American role in international law, I mean, that's things that seem so natural today. We don't participate in international institutions. We're not going to be subject to any other, anyone's jurisdictions. These things are things that's quintessentially part of American legal culture. But not so long ago, it was a completely different story, right? Um, and so, yeah, there's the, the third chapter deals primarily with like the international law side and China's particular place in it. But that's another project to really sort of explore that. Um, but in the same way, when you talk about American international law, you have to understand this popular context in which these actors are. You know, so it's not just what James Scott Brown and other people are like saying. There's a political context to getting support for that type of activity, and that's part of what sort of shifts under their feet. <coughs> During the, during the turn of the 20th century. Yeah, but isn't another part of the story <coughs> the, like the, 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 the receptability of ideas from foreign systems? Which could, you know, you, you talked about the and popular culture. I mean, you take popular culture in the US, in Britain, with a, with a, especially in Britain, with a resistance to decisions made by judges who are not British. Yeah, it's part of the stuff behind Brexit. Although most people who were voting for Brexit didn't realise that the ECHR has got nothing to do with the European Union. Or we see, um, I believe, a number of attempts in state legislatures, I think it is, in the US to prohibit courts using comparative or international law. Even things like John Bolton saying, no, we have yeah, international law, well, it's not American because it's not been. It's unconstitutional, it has not been through Congress. So I think one of the lessons is, is looking at, you know, it's not in the book, but in my efforts to think about other projects, is comparative law is hard. Law is parochial. Law is strong parochial tendencies, right? So I'm not sort of, you know, on the regret side of saying that you can't transplant between legal systems, that it's like impossible, everything's too culturally embedded. Otherwise, I would still teach in an anthropology department instead of law, right? Because I think this type of interaction can be productive, but you have to make a real effort, right, to stymie these more parochial tendencies, right? And again, anytime when you're dealing with like cultural identity, countries that strongly identify with their legal traditions, 
totally co coincidental, you know, the U.S. coming from the U.K., this idea of the common law, even though it gets separated out, is still core, right? We, we, we embody certain types of, like, legal norms, right? And people have all these things, like, what the rule of law is. No one can really decide what it is, but we know that it's really important, and we know that our version is the best sort of version. So some of these things, like the whole debate on judicial citation of like other law in the U.S., one of the fascinating aspects is you have people who say, like, we should really cite this, even though they don't really cite it dispositively that often, but they'll also engage in this sort of export efforts, right? So plenty of the judges who've written whole books, right, about why we should cite foreign law, even though culturally, right, politically it's a non-starter, engage in this other type of work and they don't see a relationship between the two things. And part of what I'm saying is you can't be sort of like a you know exporting technocrat and a legal cosmopolitan at the same time, but that's actually the best sort of that we've gotten right on a systemic level, uh, and that's partly why you can see how these things get so deeply entrenched because they're sort of seen as being completely separate. But my argument is like historically they're totally related, and you can find these dynamics in other places. So uh, even like in Japan, that engaged in these incredibly creative acts of global surveys and comparative law. It's hard to sustain that over time, right? Even if you build in comparative law inputs into legislative procedures or have comparative law bureaus, the influence of these things tends to rise and fall with sort of other exogenous factors quite significantly. And thank you very much for your presentation. And my, I have a question. The first question, question is, do you think that American law can um, exert its influence on Chinese law by the Chinese graduates who graduated from the China, uh, American law schools? Because um, I, when I read some articles on the um, Kuomintang and Tai Paradise legal modernization, it's like a certain sense five power constitutional framework is quite similar to American law because he was active in American since childhood. And uh, the two main legislators who drafted the two drafts of the Chinese constitution law in 1975 and 1946, well, one, of, one of them got the PhD, uh, GSD degree from Harvard and another one got a teaching job in Stanford after 1949. And both, uh, both of them significantly influenced by American law ideas. Another question is, do you think uh, to what extent could the missionary group represent the uh, public will of America? Because when I read some newspapers in 1930s, I, feel, I find a significant different ideas between the um, English newspapers in China and the English newspapers in America. The American newspapers are more um, have more positive comment on, China, uh, on Chinese law, whereas the English newspapers published in Shanghai and Hong Kong have lots of criticism against Chinese law. I think it's because of, the, uh, because of their self-interest, because if the extraterritorial audit is being abol abolished, and then the trading court and the uh, special juris uh, um, consul court would be abolished as well, so it would affect uh, the businessman's uh, in self-interest. So, do you think the businessman's in, uh, interest in opinion is quite a different? Uh, so, and, and there's there's two two parts as I would say. I do get into the book, right, of really distinguishing between the European, British, and American views of China and how they influence it. One of the th things that happens in Europe is just the economic relationships are much more substantial. Business people have much more influence, right? There's debates in the English legislature about banning missionaries from going to China because they might mess up trade relationships. You can have that debate in the U.S., but the, the business people are not the, the strong. Now, there, there's a thing, again, I did talk, there's a whole thing about imagining the impact of America, of the Chinese market on America. You know, every time there's a depression in the 19th and early 20th century, exporting to China is supposed to solve problems. A lot of the early, like, advertising theory in the U.S. is driven, you know, by people who are, like, trying to sell the idea of the Chinese market to the Americans. But it's never robust enough to really give them influence, right, in the same sort of way. So the lack of material relationship until the contemporary. Now, you notice today, right, we do all this stuff. But it doesn't influence, right, most favored trade nation for status. Because even though the missionary idea is embedded, it's reconciled with trade interests really specifically, right? You do this type of work helps liberalize and lead to a, an economic revolution as well as a political revolution in China. Um, so there are these real substantial differences. In the 1930s, you also have to remember that almost all of those newspapers, right, and from the U.S. side are controlled by either missionaries or missionary-influenced people, and they had a very disciplined way of representing the U.S. to people in China, 
and what's going on in China to the U.S. because they're still trying to rally support, right? This shifts over time, right? The relative popularity of the missionary movement in the U.S. sort of fluctuates, but it's sort of still, in, as late as the 1940s, it's always brought up whenever there's some sort of new idea or new sort of like conflict that needs to be explained. The second question, right? So this is like the big question about um, what's the actual, like some, what's the actual influence of American law in China, right? So if you're going to say like 1935, right, and all the various constitutions of, uh, I mean, it's it's not even, not important enough from my point of view to emphasize. Roscoe Pound, there are lots of people who, especially went to Taiwan, cited him as a seminal influence, right? Does that mean that that impacted Chinese law or Taiwanese <coughs> law? Not so much. Now today. You can see the impact of American law on whole areas of, especially like private Chinese law. Right? But that's not the result of the sort of missionary effort, and it's not just sort of following an Americanized pattern. Right? I think one of the things about this particular method right, is this is the idea that we can do this type of transplantation to direct in a way that we think is normally desirable these developments. Right? But we are the most economically powerful country in the world. Right? Our impact on international economic law, contracting practice, all sorts of things reflects this idea. So it's not that American law hasn't been influential, right? but it's, it hasn't been influential in the way we often portray it. Right? And it always hasn't been as influential as maybe it possibly could be right? if we had more honest conversations about how things work. Now, things get better over time. In the 1980s, you could read journals in China where people talk about like, American corporations and shareholder democracy, and how corporations represented, you know, this foundation of American political I mean, it's totally not true, right? Shareholder democracy is, is, is incredibly unpopular as a theory in the U.S., right? But because it's represented in this idealistic way, it stultifies this type of understanding. So I think one of the interesting things about China in this, this period of time is this incredibly active efforts to engage in comparative law. Give students scholarships to go to places to get GSDs, LLMs, PhDs, and other places, right? Um, so this, this influence does happen, but it doesn't happen in this particular way, and I still think, I mean, I worked at these centers in the US, right, and where, where lots of LLM foreign scholars would come, and one of the difficulties they always had was getting the people they interacted with to get out of the missionary mold, right, and not just try to project their vision of their ideas on them, and have an honest conversation that something valuable is happening in a foreign country, right? And that, you know, the adoption of this method. Now, there are plenty of particular individuals who are able to move <coughs> this discourse, right? Some of them are my friends, right? Um, but this is still a large phenomenon where if you go to the average law school in the US right now, you can find like 100 LLMs, 40 of them from China, and there's not a single comparative lawyer on the faculty. So how do you think that works out in practice? Do you think those people all have you know, a really robust understanding of, of, of the American legal system and its particular history, or does it financially sustain those law schools, right? This is part of the don't, don't, don't put that in public, right? I'll never get a job <laughs> in the US ever again, all right? Um, but that's, this, that's that distortive effect. So you can have this influence, right? It's, it's part of the natural transmission of ideas in transnational context, but it's really important, from my point of view, how it's carried out to make that an, an effective and productive uh, process. Sorry. Um, thank you very much for the presentation. Really interesting. Yeah. Uh, the approach that you think the Americans were taking in the 1930s um, with regards to their interaction with, uh, with China, um, and the one the Germans and the other civil law jurisdiction were taking, if you put this together, what do you think the Chinese can learn from that in terms of their interaction with the world today? Is that something that they can kind of to learn from this approach and how they interact with their other people. Well, uh, as, as uh, anyone uh, from China would know, national interpretations of the past are incredibly important, and different figures, right, uh, get reinterpreted over time, uh, and their, uh, what they, sort of the correctness of their actions, right? Chiang Kai-shek doesn't get rehabilitated that much, but other people, right, um, do. And so I think when they look back to this period, you can see that you know, a lot of these Chinese leaders, hey, they're not just passive. I mean, the part of the book is that they're not passive recipients. They're actively manipulating these foreign biases, right? Yuan Chikai, you know, knows that Americans are dominated by missionaries. You know, and he says all sorts of things about sending prayers to the Americans, right? Even though you know him personally, right? He doesn't have any affiliation for that. So I think in many ways, the Chinese side learned the story already, right? And I think part of the story of even like the Soviet uh, CCP relationship, 
played this out exactly the same way. The Soviets, who are, actually have their own type of exceptionalism, did the same sort of thing. They're like, oh, we're going to give birth to a new legal system in China. Ten years later, you have the Sino-Soviet split, and all of a sudden the Russians are saying, like, oh, the Chinese, they're just, they don't know how to deal with law. Right? It's crazy for Americans to think they want to claim that from the Russian side. But nonetheless, they did. So I actually think people have learned that lesson. And there are sort of, like, threads of, like, I think people over have an overly idealistic idea of American liberalism that affects some of the reform strategies that people take during this period of, uh, during subsequent eras. Um, but, you know, like, for example, debates with friends about, like, public impact litigation, right? People think this is really central to American law and transformed us over, like, the 20th century. <coughs> public impact litigation should be one of those things that's exported to other countries. Right? And people adopted that, those, some of those ideas and then very quickly realized, right, that's not a good strategy in other places. So I think on a political level, most Chinese regimes have been pretty savvy about this uh, dynamic already. They know sort of how to sort of play uh, upon these ideas. Um, but I think the warping of the communication affects things on a more personal, intellectual level when people, especially in an authoritarian regime, are thinking about their own domestic strategies. Because right? we're not really, if you, if you really think for some reason, right, that China should be a democracy, right? And you want to facilitate that. You don't facilitate that by telling people fairy tales, right, about how states get formed and how democracy is born, right? You actually undermine them. So that's part of the thing I discussed at the end of the book about the ethics of engagement, right? Um, it's, there, so these are real serious stakes, you know, uh, on a lot of level, and you're not doing people's favors by just saying, like, well, there's something bad and we must do something and we must do it in this particular type of way. But again, the book is really, again, it is aimed at an American audience, like, stop doing things this way, do it this way, right? But again, the principles are fairly general. Um, and I think there's lots about the post-78 relationship, right, mm -hmm. uh, that reflects these, these, these long-standing patterns. Jed, just, you intimated it in your, in your, sort of your response right there, but if, if we flipped it and said, what is something that in the West, or American personalize it, uh, that could be learned from elsewhere, if there was a voice speaking to us and telling us some lessons other than listen, right? What would be some of the stuff that you picked up on? So, you know, this is, so this is the, also the other like, very utilitarian pushback. Because of this language of transplantation is so strong, people are always like, okay, so what part of some other foreign legal system should we copy? If this is true, what part of China's legal system should we copy, you know, for ourselves, right? And I try to get away, in like my other writings about comparative law, I try to get away from that idea that this copying is what happens. So I'll give you an example. I've written a piece on, uh, that involves like discussions of labor rights in China and the US. Right? And I mean, in this way, I don't want to seem like I'm uh, uncritical right, of authoritarianism, wherever it may be. But I'm saying if you look at like, the discourse of labor and employment rights in the US, and you look at the discourse of labor and employment <coughs> rights in China, they're actually getting really close to each other. And if you care about and you think that a democratic and authoritarian regime should have different labor relations, that's deeply troubling, right? So you can learn, right? That's, I mean, that's just a simple, like, dis typical descriptive theoretical move, right? Because there's empirical things happening in other countries that are relevant. Um, I think the most, you know, straightforward examples is things like during our healthcare reform, right? It was so important that we not do what other countries do that we closed ourselves off to the huge amount of empirical data out there about how you run a whole range. I mean, people say, like, oh, these, like, European socialist healthcare, we can't do that. But Australia has a system that's sort of a hybrid, right, public-private provision, right? But no one was talking about that. Um, you know, there's all these sort of uh, the major financial securities reform, all these different things. It's not that we need to copy something that someone else, but we can test out ideas. We can see how things have worked out in other contexts. We can even learn from these failed export efforts, right? I mean, should we export plea bargaining to authoritarian regimes? No, right? But there are people who are doing it because they think this is part of modern criminal procedure, right? And it shows, right, when those things fail, some of the, the, the weaknesses of the system in the U.S. as well. Right? So my type, this is why like, my ideal vision of comparative legal practice is towards this sort of domestic reform, right? But it's just an empirical social science like everything else. It's not like a jingoistic exercise of someone's law system being better in some qualitative and inherent sense, but that there's all this sort of a, a empirical data that we can use to test uh, against our own experiences. And it's in the same way, other there are things that are good about American law. Other places have, you know, want to copy aspects of our law. At least they should understand it in an intelligible way. I don't think direct copying is 
all that useful, right? But, you know, there's wonderful things in American legal history. There's terrible things in American history, like most places, right? Um, but, you know, you have to be able to do a lot of work to, you know, see how that might apply in a particular national context. And all the stuff I'm talking about the, in the book just get in the way, essentially. These types of attitudes get in the way of that type of analytic process. So, uh, thank you very much for sharing this time together in the evening. Uh, and to Jean and Ian and Dakara as well sure. for organizing this, and most importantly to Jed for being here. Thank you again. Thank you guys.